Now I'd like to introduce you to our next speaker. Uh, he's, he chairs a program at the National Defense University on energy and environmental security, uh, Dr. Richard Andrus. Uh, he actually spearheaded the nation's first comprehensive examination of this with multiple other agencies and industry sector folks just last year. Uh, we listened earlier today about how difficult facing these issues are anywhere in the world, including Japan. We had an extensive discussion of the political realities that make it almost impossible to face down these kinds of issues. Just as the same way you don't like to do it personally, no one in the political world wants to do it either. Uh, and so our next speaker has a great set of insights, not only on the problem technically uh, and logistically, but what it takes uh, from a mindset to be able to approach this. And I look forward to his comments in the next few minutes. Dr. Andrus. Chuck, thank you very much. I, I have uh, 15 minutes. Is that uh, I hope Chuck hasn't been too modest over the day in terms of the uh, strides he's taken in, in uh, trying to address and look at this problem. He's made some, uh, some very important um, uh, connections and attempts to address this problem, and it is a national uh, problem and a very, very tricky one. I was, uh, I was interviewed by a Reuters reporter last week, and she had a very interesting story. With the end of the Mayan calendar and the apocalyptic doomsday uh, stories that are coming out. She wanted to do a story on why more apocalypses, or is it apocalyi? Uh, <laughs> why they don't happen. And so she called up, and uh, particularly she had seen some of the work we'd done on grid security, and she said, well, why is it that we don't have more of these apocalypse-like uh, events occurring? Uh, what, is the, what is the structure? What is it that you do in the government uh, that heads these things off in advance? And I had to think about that for a minute. And I said, well, you know, we, we do have a lot of procedures, and we're very good at dealing with the things we're used to. If we've had a crisis in the past, we've probably developed some way of, of handling it in the future. But there are three particular problems which can complicate our response and make it difficult to respond to a future potential catastrophic event. And the first one is if it's a very low probability but high impact event. If something happens very rarely, uh, but if it occurred, it would be a, a, a catastrophe, potentially. We have a hard time dealing with that. We have a hard time dealing with events which are not normally distributed, uh, with hurricanes, with weather, with earthquakes. A lot of times you can look at them, you'll have smaller earthquakes leading up to a larger one. The, the events are, they fall along a normal standard distribution curve, and so you can look at it and you can predict about how often a 100-year flood will occur based on the events that you've seen in the past. But when an event is not distributed normally, uh, such as uh, extreme solar weather, it's harder for us to deal with that. But the hardest thing, the, the biggest impediment to dealing with events, uh, crisis events, cata cataclysmic events, is when authority or responsibility for dealing with the event uh, is spread over a large group. So if you have a problem like the U.S. electric grid, where ownership is spread across 1,500, 2,000 different entities, when regulation is spread across 50 states and many more localities, boards of governors, state legislatures, there's a collective action problem. It makes it very difficult for any particular company, state, organization, regulatory body to step in and take responsibility for it because the problem belongs to everyone. And that's where we find ourselves today with this particular problem. And we've had a lot of trouble dealing with it specifically because the problem is owned by so many different entities. So um, about Four years ago, uh, a friend of mine, who I don't know if he's in the audience, but Mike Imany, uh, a very visionary uh, thinker on this subject, came and asked if we could put together a, a series of exercises, which we eventually called Secure Grid. And we looked at the vulnerability of the electric grid to various different types of threats. And over the last four years, we've looked at physical threats, cyber threats, and threats from extreme solar weather. And the, our approach on this was not as engineers. I'm not an engineer. I'm a policy guy. But our approach was to try to bring in engineers. We bring in smart people. We bring in policymakers. We bring in folks from the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, Department of Homeland Security, from the labs, from private industry, from everyone who might have a stake in addressing this problem. And we tried to get them to talk together. 
We tried to get the folks from the utilities and the labs to specify how serious various types of threats were. Was this the kind of a threat that could lead to a cascading outage which would affect a large region of the country or the region as a whole? Uh, how serious was the threat posed by cyber attacks, by terrorist organizations, criminal organizations, by nation states potentially, uh, such as Iran, uh, if we were to become involved in uh, hostile military action? How serious was the threat? What would happen to the United States? How, how serious would the threat be in terms of the damage inflicted upon the United States should the electric grid be taken out by one of these threats? Um, could we respond? How quickly could we get power back up? And we looked at this, and the picture that emerged from this uh, was not a pretty one, to say the least. Uh, the different organizations responsible for securing, for authority, for legislation, for administration, for ownership of the grid were simply not prepared to deal with these uh, large threats. They could deal with small threats and standard threats, and the type of threats that you see from month to month or year to year very, very effectively. And you know, absolutely, uh, the, the, the utility companies, private industry is fantastic at dealing with the types of threats that it's used to. But the types of threats that we were talking about, cataclysmic effects, serious uh, perhaps national security affecting wartime threats or extreme solar weather effect. Uh, the, these were not the types of threats that private utility companies or local boards of governors or regulators were able to deal with. And we saw a picture of emerging of something that was very serious. So we came up with three scenarios that we were particularly worried about. And the first was physical attack on the grid. We looked at that and we found vulnerabilities and we found that nobody was dealing with them on any sort of large scale. Uh, if we had small physical attacks on the grid, we could deal with them. We couldn't deal with large, very large attacks on the grid in a physical sense. The second type of uh, exercise we ran and looked at was cyber attacks. And again, we found that the, the grid was able to, in fact does on a regular basis, uh, uh, persist in the face of small scale cyber attacks. But if there was to be a very large scale cyber attack on the grid, it could cause some extremely serious persistent outages uh, in which we're not just talking about loss of money, but potentially uh, large-scale loss of life. And the third and the, uh, the potentially probably the most serious was the threat of either natural occurring or man-made EMP. And this is the type of uh, nightmare scenario which we were completely unprepared to deal with. Now, we deal with EMP, uh, so extreme solar weather, on a regular basis. So it, as long as it's at a, a regular level, a standard level, the type of thing we see from decade to decade, uh, the, the answer is, of course, the companies are able to deal with it. It's not going to be a problem. But if we have another serious event, such as we had in 1859 or 1921, so we've had, a, we've had an N of two, 150 years, we've had two cases. Uh, so we don't know if one will occur again in the near future, but if one does occur on that scale, uh, the answer is we are absolutely unprepared to deal with it. It will cause very serious problems. The question would be, does it affect, or how large is the region that it affects? And if an event of this type affected and blacked out a very large region of the country or uh, the North American continent as a whole, uh, the loss of life could be extremely high, perhaps on par with the small nuclear war. That's what, uh, that's what we looked at. Now, this was very controversial because the people who perhaps know the equipment best, which would be the utility companies or the manufacturers of the transformers which are most vulnerable to this type of threat, uh, were very reluctant to talk openly about them. And particularly the companies that own the transformers were extremely reluctant to admit any sort of vulnerability. So I cannot say uh, how vulnerable any particular transformer was or our, our speakers, our scientists said they were, but the picture that emerged was that the academic community, the scientific community, and the national security community thought that there was a very high risk of vulnerability of transformers and other equipment, and the companies that owned the equipment and had a very high stake in um, protecting their assets generally were unwilling to uh, submit them to testing or to otherwise uh, admit a vulnerability. So it created some real problems. Given that, we went and looked at what would happen to the country in the event of a large-scale regional power outage. Accepting the, the uh, ambiguity of how particularly likely an event was to occur, and then if it was to occur, there was a great deal of ambiguity about how likely specific transformers would be to be knocked out. But we had to move on because that's the best information we had available, and we looked at what would happen to the social fabric. And what we found there was also very interesting. 
I'll, I'll paint a very quick uh, picture of it. Uh, in a short period of time after the power went out in any region of the United States, uh, all electronic commerce would cease. What that meant was uh, commerce, since almost everyone uses only electronic commerce today, most stores, almost all commerce would instantly cease. You could no longer buy food, you could no longer buy gasoline. Of course, when the power goes out, the gas pumps go out, so you can no longer travel uh, once your gas tank uh, ran dry. Uh, water would stop flowing in most metropolitan areas within a few hours. Telephone service, even landlines, would stop very, uh, very quickly. Most households have about three days of food on hand, which would run out. Uh, the, so the food would run out, transportation would run out. If the grid outage was small enough, uh, we know how to deal with that. If the edge of the outage is not too far out, we can get emergency responders in, we can get, we can fix the equipment. If the edge is far enough out, we can't. So if you're in the darkened area, you're on your own. Um, we talk with a lot of law enforcement, National Guardsmen, and the leadership believed that most of them would stay on the job for approximately three days, perhaps as long as a week, but they were mostly in consensus that uh, law enforcement would go home and stop working very quickly into an outage. Uh, given the lack of food and commerce, we thought that this uh, posed some serious uh, problems with keeping, um, keeping the population uh, in line in and uh, the rule of law. Uh, with food running out, with uh, medicine running out, the long-term result, if we could not get generation up again, uh, was a large-scale loss of life. So that's what we concluded from this. And then we looked at ways of mitigating this. It's not quite as bad as it might seem because a lot of local generation is local. And potentially it could be black started and, and gotten up to speed again. Um, but right now, most local generation is not capable of getting back online without access to the larger grid, which meant that uh, this was a potential area for improvement. Uh, if we could somehow uh, get local power generation able to start again quickly after an outage on its own without connection to the grid, we could island, we could get islanded power going and we could mitigate the worst effects uh, in a very serious way. Even if we couldn't do that, we found that if we could get emergency responders uh, access to power, uh, perhaps through distributed renewable energy that was available even after diesel fuel stopped flowing in the event of a uh, large regional or national outage. If we could get uh, emergency responders power quickly, it mitigated the problem uh, immensely. Hospitals, law enforcement, and so forth. Uh, so looking through this, we found that there were things that the local, at the local level that could be done to substantially reduce loss of life, even in the event of one of these very low probability massive crises. The question that we came to, though, was what would be the Department of Defense's role and uh, the Department of Homeland Security role be in a massive crisis, one of these low probability, I want to keep stressing that, we were only concerned with very low probability but very high impact events, not, not the, midi, uh, the middle row of uh, events here. What could the, the federal government do? And looking at this, we said it does not have the assets to do very much. Uh, Many of our, our private and local participants in these exercises came out and they said, well, we expect the military will probably step in and solve things. If things really come off the track, if there's loss of life, we expect the military to help us out. Uh, the military folks in the room said that's probably not going to happen. In fact, we're not sure that we can sustain operations even at a base level, an installations level, if the power goes out. For emergency, from very important uh, national things, uh, yes, uh, we can keep those going. When it comes down to keeping the local base going, the odds are we're going to have serious problems. Don't count on us for help. So the military cannot help in that way. But there is something that the federal government can do quite effectively. And this is something that came up over and over. The state and local level, the private level, people do not have the ability to assess the level of the threat. At the federal level, we do. We have national labs. We have the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security. We have the ability to sound the alarm. If we can go out and we can talk to, explain the problem, explain the potential solutions to the problem to the folks out there in America, to the state level, the local level, the county level, the private utilities, they will take the action necessary. But we've got to do that. That means that uh, trusted folks who can gain the data necessary, look at it from a, uh, with a non jaundiced eye without any incentive to uh, overblow the problem or undersell it, uh, if that group of people in the federal government can, can clearly express the problem to the American people, to the stakeholders, to the utilities, they will take action. 
And that's something that we can do. I applaud uh, Dr. Stockton in particular for the action that he's taking along these lines and uh, Assistant Secretary Burke as well. So I think there is something that we can do here. Uh, and also some of the legislation that uh, has been proposed by the EMP caucus uh, and others on the Hill, I think this is very uh, important and this is something that, uh, that we should give more uh, credence to. And um, I, th I think that's it for my comments. I'd be happy to take any questions. I'm sure we will have questions. Uh, wave hands. Come to my side of the room if you if you care to. Um, I uh, I would ask a first question while people are beginning to line up, which would be: um, uh, You've been watching all of these organizations begin to engage, um, and you apparently see some signs of hope. Uh, what are the practical next things that those in this room could be doing? themselves over the next few months or so after this day is over to carry that ball a little bit further downfield? Well, a lot of that depends on the specific organization. The Department of Homeland Security has been doing a lot of work in this region, and I think that um, they need a lot more support for uh, their, uh, their programs regarding the electric grid. Uh, Department of uh, Defense also, I think it needs to be given a mandate in terms of um, stepping forward and having some responsibility or authority to take on the problem on a larger national level. Uh, but, you know, it, it's funny. There's, a, there's some interesting work on uh, presidents' powers. Presidents, you would think, are very, very powerful, but actually they're quite limited in what they can do. Their main power is the power of persuasion in many cases, and I think that's what we've got for the federal government right now. We have the power to persuade, we have the power to get information, and we have the power to send it out to the people that need it. Uh, I'm a little bit worried that uh, the federal, this is not a federal problem. This is a local problem. It's a private problem. Uh, so we have an important role to play, but it's in conveying information and in persuasion more than in forcing uh, anybody to take uh, specific action. Uh, sure, this is uh, Tom Popick. And uh, my question is, I, I think that there's a disconnect between some of the presentations that we've gotten this morning, yet the relatively small size of, of the group here in the auditorium, and the hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of Americans who have become, I guess you could call them preppers. You know, th these are people that are you know, kind of taking their own action. Uh, and maybe some of them have actually uh, given up on the government in a way. Uh, when you talk about bringing this message out to local politicians, I wonder what their thought process would be. You know, is this going to disturb uh, the public or maybe panic the public? Uh, and maybe it isn't politically wise to do this, or you know, maybe that's really how we save ourselves is by individual uh, preparedness along with government uh, uh, coordination. So I'm just, my, my question when it really comes down to it, have you talked to political leaders about this and kind of gotten inside their mental calculus as to how they would handle this kind of problem? Well, all right, so in Washington, you know, what is the worst thing you can possibly do, and that sound hysterical, right? You, the last thing anyone wants to do is be an alarmist. If there's any way to get rid of your credibility rapidly, it's to start sounding like you're too worried and too crazy. Uh, so nobody wants to take on the problem. Nobody, even if it's a very serious problem, everyone wants to sound calm and leave it up to someone else to step forward and sound the alarm. In terms of uh, uh, preppers or survivalists, I, I'm not terribly familiar with that. I, I'll say common sense says uh, everyone should have more than three days of food on hand at home. Uh, you know, I mean, if you've lived in Washington over the last year, you know that's the case simply because the power's gone out here uh, for more than three days. And if you live in New York, you're highly aware of that as well, especially if you're in the, I think it's a million folks that still don't have power back on after Sandy. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, seeing the Marines go down the streets in New York distributing food is kind of a, a sobering sight. So in terms of, of preparation, uh, you know, we've gotten very complacent in the country. It used to be people did have the capability to subsist without power for some amount of time. We don't have that anymore. And uh, if I was going to make the recommendations to, uh, you know, to Main Street, I would say make sure that you have a few weeks of food on hand, uh, some water purification tablets. This is just common sense. Okay, Wendy Richards. Um, 
I had been to a presentation in my community, which was from a regional EMP uh, organization that dealt with community preparedness, and their planning um, revolved around utilizing the libraries because they're dispersed uh, throughout the communities in, in a good manner, and having the libraries be the backup location so that if they had a limited ability to bring in supplies, they could bring them to the libraries, and the libraries could then disperse them from there. And I asked how they were going to let the community know about this, um, and they said, well, we would, you know, in such an event, we would then put it out on the radio. <laughs> and I said, that, that sounds good in theory. <laughs> he, it just, it wasn't even, uh, it was a preposterous idea that that, that was not a reasonable end solution. Even just the limited solution, of, I suggested put a sign on the library so the people that go to the library at least know that in the case of an emergency, this would be utilized as a distribution center, and, and to make sure. And the libraries were librarians were being trained to assist in this, but it's not something the community would be aware of. Even though there are some good plans in place, they're not communicating clearly, and they're making assumptions that the power is going to be there, or at least the backup generation, the fuel, that people will know to listen to their radio, and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's, or maybe we could just email everyone. <laughs> uh, this is Gail Nordling. Uh, you indicated whether there was something that the federal government could do, and I believe there is. You indicated, and I'm certainly in agreement, that there are many utilities and utility-related companies, probably well over a thousand. Some are very progressive and some will start doing some things to protect their grid or their facilities, but that leaves a lot of others that aren't. And I think this should be a national effort to protect the whole grid and to have uniformity throughout the country rather than little bits and pieces here and there uh, that are protected. So whether it's legislation or regulations or, or some other type of economic uh, encouragement, I think would be a great thing to do. I, I agree with you, and I would love to see Congress take some action on this. Uh, it's a national problem. Uh, the, you know, the, the problem is there isn't a constituency, there isn't a group that can organize, like I imagine some of the folks in this room are, there isn't a constituency that can organize and lobby Congress on behalf of the American people. We're very bad at lobbying on behalf of the American people. But there are lots of organizations that have a large financial stake in arguing against this that can hire lobbyists that are up on the Hill every day arguing against any sort of national level legislation on this, uh, this type of, of problem. How do you overcome that? You know, this is, this is how American government works. It was specifically designed with checks and balances to prevent a lot of quick action, and sometimes that comes back to bite us, and I think this is one of those, those occasions. So. Hi. Um, you know, uh, listening to these uh, discussions here, it's obvious that we're not talking about the three-day problem or the seven-day problem. We're talking about the low, uh, low probability, high impact, two-year problem is what I'm hearing. So kind of piggying back off the, the gentleman over here, who's looking into maybe just ex um, researching how a citizen can survive two years without the government? Is that not a simpler problem set to handle than dealing with fixing the whole grid, uh, doing all this policy versus saying, hey, if this goes down, we could put um, research together about how a citizen would actually survive without the federal government for two years of time. You know, it, it, we've become so dependent on the grid, right. I'm not sure there is a way for that to happen. If the power went out, I don't know how the American people would survive unless we got it back on again. Well, and, that, and that's kind of the question, why are we not researching? Uh, as the gentleman says, there's TV shows about, you know, people that are going off grid that are no longer surviving on the grid, relying on the American government. We're talking about how can we handle 200,000 people being sick in one area at a time, but we're not looking into the actual probability or possibility. Again, if we're talking about low, low uh, sure. probability, high impact, then why aren't we bringing in that possibility of how could we allow American citizens well, we, to survive we, without the government? Yeah, I, I mean, this, this, is a, this is a legitimate question. It's an important one. Uh, we talked about this with some agencies. We talked about it with Department of Homeland Security. We talked about some others. And their answer was, look, if something like that happened, it's game over. We have no capability to deal with it. There's no possibility. There's nothing we could do that's beyond our scope. So that's it. Uh, if, if maybe I could respond just a little bit, too. This is something that I've looked into from a mathematical standpoint. Uh, what I did was I did a ratio of the population in each of the 50 states 
uh, to the food production in those states. And when you do that kind of analysis, what you quickly find out is that most of the food is grown in the center of the United States and most of the population is on the coasts. And so if there's any major uh, infrastructure failure, the most fundamental challenge that we're going to have is how we get food grown in the center of the country uh, to the coasts and what uh, the uh, pr uh, p government planning, frankly, would be for that event, in my opinion. I guess I would have a follow-on question. Um, uh, Dr. Wells may still be here, too. Uh, you guys do a lot for disaster relief worldwide. Uh, the world at large had always counted on our strategic grain reserve to feed 50 million starving Chinese or Russians. We did away with that some years back. Uh, what are your recommendations to reestablish the equivalent of a strategic food or strategic grain reserve so that uh, if such an emergency were to hit us, we would be better prepared as opposed to merely having money from the Stafford Act to go somewhere else in the world to find the food we can't get? Yeah, we, we've talked about that before. Uh, it sounds like a good idea. I mean, we should, we, we just don't have that mentality anymore. We don't have that, that war footing, World War II memory uh, mentality. Everything has gone so well in the United States for so long that it's very difficult for us to, to think about uh, things coming off the track and really going bad. Uh, you know, talk to, talk to if, you, if you think this is important, talk with your legislator about it and uh, try to get some action. Uh, I really can't do a lot better than that. Hi, Dr. Hendricks. I met you a couple of years ago at your at the National Defense University uh, program. Jerry Stola, I work with Chuck Manto. Uh, the question is, even if we start shielding the electric industry, has the U.S. military conceived of an, an, a technological iron dome over the U.S., including the uh, CIA intelligence on the field monitoring perhaps loading of nuclear weapons on cargo ships. Mm -hmm. And what I meant by technological was either satellite or drone or 24K Navy capability with uh, uh, Patriot missiles rather than the Aegis missile, which is in the billions. Has this been considered? As, as for what the CIA is doing, you have to ask them. <laughs> Um, but, uh, right, we, we don't have missile defense uh, over the United States. Uh, do we have another question? Okay. Um, well, what I, thank you very much, Dr. Andrus. And thank you for the role you've been playing at NDU. Uh, I'd like Dr. Baker to come up now as we uh, stretch again. Let's stand up and stretch and give another round of applause for Dr. Andrus and Dr. Baker. See, they'll think what they got, standing ovations. It's really our chance to stretch and um, get ready for the next session in about one minute.